Good day to you, my friends. Welcome back to Deep Dives of Falshan, the Super Catholic Catechesis Podcast. This has been inspired by the Catechism's reminder that periods of renewal in the Church are periods of intense catechesis. And so I offer you intense catechesis. I've loved doing this catechesis using the saints here. If we're not inspired, what is the point of catechesis? Catechesis is an entrance into the life of the church. It is not facts. The church got that one wrong, and we, we're we suffering from it. We're suffering from that big time because we never brought our children into the church, into the life of the church. We only brought them in the church buildings and gave them facts, and it was not sufficient. It was not sufficient. So we're correcting that these days. We're going backwards uh, into time to recall the great moments of church history. And the great moments of church history is simply brought forward in the, the moments of the saints. Wherever there's a saint, that is a moment of excellence. Uh, that is a moment of great church history. And we give God praise for that. And the most awesome thing about this is when there is decay in the church, there are also saints. And so we can't ever write off any time period as saying, eh, psh, we totally got a bogus. Uh, they had it bogus back then. That was a bad time. It's like, that's garbage. You're like, there were saints then, and those saints can't be ignored. We have to recognize that God really loved the world through those saints, and that's that's a great thing. So as we're talking about the saints for the new evangelization, I've been talking about a couple, uh, several Francis's and a St. Philip Neri, and now I'll address the the dearly... Uh, favored and loved Therese of Lisieux. She's definitely a favorite. She's like the most famous saint from like the hundred, last 150 years, or at least in the top 50, uh, excuse me, top five, top five. But she might be the greatest of all of them. She might be the greatest of all of them. Uh, I want to tie her very closely with mission. There are some very easy ties with mission, but I'm really going to draw on St. John Paul II. But before I do that, I think we should have a little prayer here. Heavenly Father, giver of holiness. You gave holiness to the world in the person of Jesus Christ, and you've given Jesus Christ to your church, and the church is made up of many persons, many members, and you've given that son of yours to, to us. Help us to receive him more, to live the life of the a saint more and allow us to reflect your most beautiful glorious wonderful holy light into the world just as saint Teresa of Lisieux has done help us to love just as she had loved amen so john paul ii really brings this home he says the call to mission derives of its nature from the call to holiness the universal call to holiness is closely related to mission. Every member of the faithful is called to holiness and mission. The missionary spirituality of the church is a journey towards holiness. End quote. St. John Paul II the Great is reminding us, ooh, he would probably be a saint for the new evangelization, wouldn't he? Okay, put that on pause there. We're going to come back to him maybe next week. Uh but he's identifying the, the essential relationship between holiness and mission. A lot of times we can forget about this and think, well, it's only the St. Francis Xavier's. It's only the, the St. Francis of Assisi. They're converting crazy amount of people only because they're going out and preaching. But St. John Paul II is saying, time out. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. How about we say that everyone has a relationship with the rest of the church and we are called to have a care for the rest of the church. We're called to have a concern that the holiness goes deeper into the hearts of those who are already believing. And we also are hoping that this holiness extends farther into the world. If someone goes into a convent and says, well, at least I got myself to work on. It's like, no, time out. Holy cow. Don't be so dang selfish. Like, how about you go into that convent? Absolutely. But pray for me. Like, what are you doing not praying for me? Like, if you're going to dedicate yourself to prayer, like, don't just pray for yourself. Like, talk about selfishness. Like, have a little love. Have a little charity. Have a, be sincerely holy. And pray for the rest of us out here. That is what I would tell such a person should they be doing it selfishly. But that's a little bit hard to imagine. 
Uh, the people that I've known who have gone into convents, which I have to say are not really anyone. I only know them secondhand. They're just all wonderful. And they're all very caring. They are not wrapped up in themselves. And that's encouraging to me. We need saints. Excuse me. If we are looking for like miracles, like if we're looking for like real mountains to be moved, the spiritually speaking, physically speaking, whatever you want to call it, then we're going to need itsy bitsy faith. We're going to need faith, not the size of mountains. We're going to need faith the size of mustard seeds. And the thing about St. Teresa of Lisieux is everything about her is small. Her great nickname is the little flower. This is a little example or analogy the, of a field of flowers. In a field of flowers, in a garden, you have the most beautiful roses. You have the large, luscious lilies. You have this flower, that flower. And yeah, sure, you have some smaller flowers as well. And St. Teresa of Lisieux said, you know what? I'm going to be one of the small flowers. God has called other people to be big flowers. I'm just going to be a small flower, and I'm going to bloom as best as I can because that's just who God made me, and holiness is simply to be the flower that God has called me to be. A little bit flowery example. Ooh, sorry about that. Uh, but that's uh, that's how it goes. That's really sincere, though. It comes from her heart, and I love it. She was small. Uh, she only died. She only lived until I forget exactly how old she was, but like 24, 25, 26, maybe. Eve, she just, everything about her was small. She never left the convent. When she went into the convent at age 15, I'll talk more about that later on, she just stayed there. You know, she didn't like go on excursions out into the town after that. No, she stayed there. Uh, her, the limits of her world were the walls of the convent. She didn't go out to, to visit people. She didn't go out to buy groceries. She didn't do all of that. The most contact she would have is with with uh, people uh, in her convent, obviously, but then also she would have a little bit of contact with the outside world when they would come and visit, and I believe they had to speak through uh, kind of a uh, some kind of shield. It would be a little bit penetrable so people could hear each other, but they would talk through this great that was her world. Just imagine <clears throat> if you lived, yeah, I would imagine that her convent was like the size of a dollar tree. I'm in rural Oklahoma here. We got dollar trees all over the place. It's it's kind of big in my mind. That is what I believe their convent was the size of, super small. I mean, it's not like itsy bitsy, but it's not big. It's not big. There'd be a little courtyard, I'm sure. I've been there. I can't remember <laughs> what, it, what it looked like, though. I'm embarrassed to say uh, but, you know, there would have been a little courtyard there. We see that courtyard and a lot of pictures of her. There would have been little cells where each one of them would have stayed. And there were, oh, I kind of get the impression, maybe like 30 sisters. So it might be a little bit bigger than a Dollar General. But these rooms are not big at all. There would be room for a bed and probably a chair and a writing desk. And that would all probably be in a little room and that would be tight. <laughs> and that was it. She was moody. She was very particular. She had a hard time. She was, you know, one of my friends, he likes St. Therese greatly. And he likes to tell people that she was very strong-willed. And people were like, no, no, no. She was so meek and she was so mild. But the reality was, is like, she had a, a very passionate interior life. She was very strongly willed as a child and and she maintained that she was very particular she had her favorite little things and she had her favorite little ways of doing things and she had a favorite way of of loving people and that's just kind of how god made her but the reality was that she was able to offer that upon the altar of charity for god this is her great genius yes she was strong-willed but she directed that will to God in a profound way, a profound way, and just a way that we cannot really imagine. I have a little book of memoirs from St. Teresa's sister, and it is so charming. These stories are so delightful. It's really just one story after another. and But the stories are just like, wow, she just like totally crucified her will. Like she, she attacked herself uh, her ego, that is, this selfishness, 
with a vengeance and really just took pride in giving it away. Not took pride in it, but just kind of said, I'm just a little flower. It's what I do. Uh, she said that she's not a big person, so she's only going to go after the little virtues. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? So I, I got a few things I want to talk about here in a little bit more of an organized way. But first, I want to mention where she came from. You know, this this flower, this little flower didn't come up in a desert. No, this f- little flower was born into a garden. Uh, that is to say a family. Uh, families are called to be a garden of saints. Absolutely. Let there be no doubt. Anyone who says, well, if I can just get my family uh, through life here, I'm going to be all right. No, 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 no. We're aiming big. You know, St. Francis Xavier said, give me souls. But but I say to you, in the spirit of St. Teresa of Lisieux and in the spirit of the new evangelization that we got to recall, you know, we're not going out and preaching for thousands of people. We don't have that many contacts with folks. But what we do have is uh, sincere, deep contacts with fewer people. And so let's say, God, give me saints. That's exactly what the St. Teresa of Lisieux's parents were and did. They were saints. They are saints. They are official saints. Uh, Zeli and, oh my goodness, what's his name? Can't think of it right now. But they're saints. They're saints in heaven. Like they are canonized officially. You know, this was done by the Pope to declare once and for all that there can be no doubt that they are in heaven. This is just an incredible thing. Louis, I believe is his name. Louis Martin. And let's strive to imitate that. Holiness needs to be principally found in families. Where can we get holy priests without holy families? Where can we get holy future parents without holy parents today? This is how it goes. There's nothing around it. If we want future holy, saintly sisters and brothers in convents and in religious orders, let's have holy and religious families. They're the seedbed. They're the garden. And we need to to recognize that. And that might mean suffering. Hate to break it to people. It might mean suffering. Um, Zelie Martin, she bore nine children. And only five of them survived. Like, that is very heavy on a mother's heart. Um, Mothers out there, could you imagine losing one child? Could you imagine losing two, three, and four? Talk about heartbreak. And yet, she allowed her heart to break, and she broke it out upon the altar of of the love for God. Uh, Thy will be done. You know, she didn't say, I understand it. She didn't say, I get it. She didn't say, oh, okay, this makes sense naturally, of course. She just said, God, I'm, I'm walking your path, and I accept. Um, certainly this was heavy for their father as well. Um, but he lived in a different way. You know, one of his great burdens in later in his life was, was Alzheimer's dementia. I don't remember exactly how it all worked, but he, he was not with it. He had to be uh, put into a, a certain home, a residence for those who had psychological uh, disabilities and that's that's kind of how he ended his life. Now, of their five surviving kids, um, well, I'll, I'll speak to the oldest ones. Uh, the oldest ones were under great care from their mother. She really wanted to pass upon these older ones all of her spiritual know-how. Uh, she was the spiritual direction for her spiritual director for her older children, who would then become the spiritual director for the younger ones. Uh, in fact, the oldest or second oldest one, um, when she was in the convent, in the Carmelite convent, Carmel is what they call that, she became Mother Superior. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Um, so of these five daughters, all of them were daughters, they all became religious sisters. They all became religious sisters. And it trickled down from the oldest. And it was passed down. Um, the reason, part of the reason at least, why... Zeli Martin was so concentrated on the older ones was because she knew she had a lump in her breast. She knew that was not healthy. She began to suffer more and more from the effects of that, and she realized that she was going to die because of this breast cancer. And years went by. She suffered with it. She didn't know what to do with it. Her brother happened to be a doctor, and, and, but, but it was too late by the time they were able to, to do anything with it. 
Um, super sad because nowadays it would have been probably a pretty easy cure because it was a lighter form of cancer, but it just had years to grow. But through that suffering, through through that the tears, through the trials, and through the continual trust in God, God forges out his saints. That's where St. Teresa of Lusu came from. For the new evangelization, we need holy families. We need holy moms. We need holy dads. We need people who can suffer in a holy way. We need people who can offer their own lives and the lives of their children to God t- entirely, entirely, and live extraordinarily focused on that, to live for nothing else. Um, they love people in town. They would go and bring, uh, they would cook for other people. They would invite people into their homes. Uh, they actually would do this. Uh, this is something we kind of think about as a modern thing, but like, no, definitely not. They, they welcome people in their homes. They saw that as a real treat. So I got three main points here that I'm going to talk about. Love, suffering, and desire. Yep, I'm going to talk about more suffering, <laughs> but we're, first we're going to talk about love. A little quote from her. Without love, deeds, even the most brilliant, count as nothing. This is just the scripture wisdom that she has inherited. She loves St. Paul. You know, think of that, that great poem, that ode to love that he writes. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not seek its own interest, blah, 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 blah. Not blah, 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 but what lovely words that I will omit here. And at the end of that, it's talking about, or maybe the beginning of that, I kind of forget the order of that, but there is one thing that lasts. Everything else can be going crazy. Everything else is is maybe going well or whatever. But if I don't have love, I'm just a banging gong. And this is what St. Teresa is hitting home. Love, 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 love. All these little virtues that she are she is pursuing of humility, of self-denial, of, of acceptance, of trials. All these are gifts that she can give to God in love. Uh, another one of her great little moments from her diary or journal or or memoirs is probably best to call it a memoir. It's called the the story of a soul. Highly recommended. If you do nothing else after this, read that. Read that. Read that. Read that. Please read that. The story of a soul. In that, she's talking about being frustrated. Because it's like, where do I fit into the world? I'm, I'm in this convent here, and God's given me some big desires. Like, I want I want to go big with, with loving people. I want to go big to be a missionary. I wanna, she wants all these different things. She sees that some people are, are the hands of the body of Christ. Some are the, the, the heart, uh, the, excuse me, the, the feet of the body of Christ, the, the different elements of the body of Christ. But she's like, where, what am I? What am I? And she opened up to St. Paul. She read what I was just referring to. And she said, ah, that's it. My vocation is love. And she began to identify herself as being the very heart of the body of Christ, the very heart of God, <laughs> to beat with the same love that the sacred heart of Jesus beats with. Love. Doing little things consistently with great love. This was the simple path of childhood, spiritual childhood. She just tried to be a child of God, to have the great profound confidence and trust in God, just as a little girl would have in her in her daddy. She tried to have that attitude towards God. And it turns out that was very fruitful. <laughs> May we all have that. But, but the principal way that a dad wants his daughter to relate, to relate with him is just simply... A confident love, a confident love that spills out into other people. Uh, to love neighbor as yourself is the second commandment, which is like the first, to love God. Secondly, her suffering. She gracefully accepted her sufferings. This was a great lesson that she received from her mom that I've already recounted to you all. So the sufferings came in different ways. There was the the existential suffering. There's a number of stories in her in her in her memoirs, the story of a soul, where 
people are just getting on her nerves. Like I said, she was very particular. She was very tuned into details, and it really kind of sucked her attention. Um, and it really brought forth a trial for her. There's one story of a sister. They're all there praying in the chapel. And this sister's she's fingering her rosary, just kind of going through the beads, creating just a little noise, a little noise. And in a room of silence, that little noise begins to scream at St. Therese. <laughs> and she just can't think about anything else. And she tried to ignore it, tried to, to go along with this this beat but then it would change and it just she couldn't she couldn't get over it until she just accepted it and she learned she decided that she was just going to love it and love this sister and this was going to be a gift that she could give to god and she was going to listen to it as if it was a great uh, orchestra concert that the lord and the, his angels were playing that's how she got around that there's another story of a sister who was splash they were like doing laundry or dishes together i forget what it was but the problem was the sister was just negligent of watching out for her her splash she was splashing in saint Teresa of Lisieux in a way that she didn't realize it but it was getting under saint Teresa's nerves and she just just sucked it up and just made it a gift of god lord i accept i'm in fact going to love it each one of these little droplets is going to be like uh, a little kiss coming from you and i thank you for them this is how she did it she played these little mind games so that she could orient all things to love of god and neighbor true stories uh the other way another way that she suffered was physically uh, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis which caused her uh, really profound suffering she part of the symptoms from this was occasional bouts with with an experience of suffocation uh, also exhaustion was a part of this uh, she would s have little sweating spells she would cough up blood like all these things for me especially the suffocation that just sounds like torture like i do not want that to have these endless coughs and end up coughing up blood and uh, have this suffocation just oh oof, god bless her but she peacefully accepted it, peacefully accepted it, even joyfully accepted it. She would maybe drift out of consciousness and be in different states of deliria, but she accepted it, and she just turned her gaze to the Lord continually. I mean, this is just saintly, where she'd suffered all that and just kept her eyes on Jesus and accepted it all as a gift of love to him. Thirdly, in the midst of that suffering, there was spirit, uh, spiritual suffering. Uh, she describes her situation. God allowed my soul to be developed in complete darkness. In complete darkness. You know, a lot of times we think, if my soul is going to grow, I'm really going to have to have these special, unique graces. If I don't hear anything from God, if I don't hear voices, <laughs> if I don't see visions, if I don't have all these warm and fuzzies, if I don't so eagerly and easily f fling myself down before the Blessed Sacrament in prayer, if that doesn't come easily, then I've failed. But the reality is, my brothers and sisters, in that spiritual darkness... The Lord forges great saints. I believe it is a common reality that people will will be drawn to the Lord through consolations. That's generally how he works. It's kind of like using a, uh, well, think of the movie E.T., where the kid is trying to draw in the extraterrestrial into his house, and he's using, I think it was Reese's Pieces. <laughs> well, sometimes God works like that, too. He helps us to feel all these warm and fuzzies so that we are drawn to him and then he takes them away and he says will you stay with me and a lot of times we're like uh i'm gonna go back to where there were the reese's pieces those were tasty just bring me back consolations lord i don't really want to grow in holiness if it means suffering if it means denial if it means that i'm not going to be able to see you and feel you if i can't feel you lord i'm really not going to be your servant just just send me back there and so they go back to the level of a beginner, and they'll never advance. St. Teresa of Lisieux reminds us all, if we are to be saints, 
We must be satisfied with whatever God gives us. If it's darkness, fine. If it's trials, fine. If it's fi- having someone in our life who's super annoying, fine. If it's <laughs> if it's great visions, you know, that's fine too. If it's these warm and fuzzies, that's going to be all right too. But the reality is it ain't going to be like that, especially if you want to be a saint. So kiss that goodbye and say, I'm going to, I'm going to buckle up and I'm going to love God at all costs. That is what we have to do if we're to advance. You can't advance until you say, I accept God's will, (laughs) even when I don't like it. Do it, please. You will have your life changed quickly, quickly. The third thing I want to talk about, the final thing here, is that she was someone of big desires. We need people today in the new evangelization who have great big desires. Open your heart and say, Lord, give me these desires. Give me these holy desires. St. Teresa of Lisieux commented on God giving her these great desires only to prepare uh, her to receive the fulfillment of those desires. To give an example, she desired to enter the convent. She, She desired to. She didn't decide to. She desired to enter the convent Uh, at an early age. It was like 14 or 15, and that wasn't really what what people did back then, nor is it today. And the superior said, no, we're not going to let you. You're you're still a girl. Like, go back home with your dad, and when you're ready, come back and be with us. And she was distraught because she just knew that this was God's will, that this was his plan. Why in the world would God give such a a burning desire if, if it couldn't be fulfilled. So her and her father and her other sister, one of the younger ones, the, the other youngest one, they went on a pilgrimage to Rome. And they had a bunch of little adventures there. But one of the things that she was able to do was have an audience with the Pope. <laughs> That's amazing. And they were told, you know, just don't don't say anything unless he speaks to you. You know, do all the, there's all the regular stuff. But when the Pope was coming by and greeted them, she couldn't hold it in. Your holiness, I have a desire to enter the convent, but they tell me I'm too young. Please, 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 please tell them that I can enter. Make an exception for me. And he told her, listen to your, your superiors and obey them. If it's meant to be, they'll let you in. And that's all he said. <laughs> so he didn't give her extra special permission. Sometimes we like to go up to the chain, up the chain, and skip the regular line of command. But that's not how God works. If it's God's will, I mean, I guess he did, she didn't get rebuked for that. It's not like it's it's a bad, bad, bad thing. But but at the same hand, we should we should be humble and accept what God has given us, the yeses and nos in our life. And if it's God's will, we can pray for it, obviously. We should pray for it if we believe it's God's will. Well, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. It will happen. God will make a path forward. And sure enough, when she was 15, she entered that convent. you got to read the story of a soul to, to hear more about that. But it's just incredible. She had another big desire, to be a priest. Yes, you heard that right. She desired to be a priest. She was never a priest, you'll tell me. How could that desire be fulfilled? But the Lord gave her a, a couple of spiritual companions who were priests, and they would exchange letters back and forth. They got them, uh, it's particular with one, so, well, I think it was a seminarian actually, but in particular with one, uh, they I, I saw this volume of letters that were sent back and forth. That these were all kept. And and she lived through them. She was able to fulfill this great desire through them. She also had a desire to be a missionary. She wanted to go to the far corners of the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And did that happen? The answer is, well, maybe, sort of. You know, she did not leave her convent. She did not go out to the missions of the world. That was not her vocation. Her vocation instead was to be withheld in those walls and to live a life of holiness and intercession but she had a desire that was strong 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 and she said when she goes to heaven she's gonna 
shower down on everyone, all kinds of roses. I forget exactly her quote there, but she's going to give people all kinds of graces from above because she is so zealous to pour forth the, the uh, God's mighty works and wonders. She wants to be God's instrument in heaven, not just on earth. And so, there are so many stories, so many stories of prayers answered specifically through the intercession of St. Therese of Lisieux. Her desire was filled radically so, fulfilled much more radically than, than any other earthly missionary because she was able to do so much more good from the side of heaven than on the side of earth. All of the fruit of her prayers she was now able to distribute to the world uh, as an emissary of Jesus Christ. As, as a key intercessor to him. Really beautiful, really beautiful. There's a lot of people out there with stories. Maybe some, I, I would imagine, I would guarantee it. There are a number of people listening to this who have, who would, who would guarantee that she has interceded for them and won for them a true prayer request. I guarantee there are people listening to me uh, who have heard that, who have received that. No doubt in my mind. Her desires were fulfilled. God gave these big desires so that he could fulfill them in big ways. She is the patroness of missions, which is just incredible. She was never a missionary, and yet she is the patroness of missions alongside St. Francis Xavier. So as we're going about our day, striving to live our mission and draw people to Christ by making friends, being friends, and bringing friends to Christ— well, boom, like, let's really ask her to fulfill our mission. We want some prayers answered. Please, please, please. To conclude, just a little quotation. My mission is to make God loved. My mission is to make God loved. The primacy is on God. And the way that we fulfill that mission is by bringing others to him. As a new pastor, one of the things that is very clear in my mind is that I am here for the glory of God, principally through the salvation of souls. I I also add on their works of mercy because I I do believe in that greatly. But my mission is for the glory of God through the salvation of souls. Essentially, that's what she's saying. My mission is to make God loved. Maybe I should say like that. That's a lot better way. (laughs) My brothers and sisters, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Deep Dives with Father Sean. Next week, we will have uh, the continuation, probably the last of our saints here, the Saints for the New Evangelization, St. John Paul II. Uh, I appreciate you all greatly. Share this with a friend if you believe this is helpful. Uh, This is a bit of my bantering, but I think it might be helpful for some people. I hope that it is. I pray that it is. May God bless each and every one of you and your family and friends. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, my friends. Bye.